Welcome back to The Garden Guys. I listened to The Proper Care and Feeding of a Husband by Laura. I'm going to butcher this, especially with my lisp. Laura Slushinger. That's a hard one for me. I am sure somebody will pop up the book somewhere around here. Hopefully, please, please pop up a book somewhere around here. <clears throat> I listened to the book. This is the first audio book on Audible I have come to completion with. I am super stoked about it. <laughs> I am somebody who has a very hard time retaining things audible, audibly. I have to read it. I have to read it to retain it. Took me about eight hours to finish a two-hour book. But we persevered. I got past my frustration. And I actually, it was a really good book. She is a very brazen, older woman. I had, some of the things she said, I was like, whew, get it, Laura. I have some direct quotes, so you'll see. These notes, I have put zero thought into these notes. <laughs> I was listening to the audiobook. I would say, hey, Siri, make a note. And I would blurb out whatever I'd blurb out. And then it was sitting in my notes. And then a week ago or so, I transferred those notes into my Kindle. And I, like I said, zero thought, we are going to experience this together today. All right. <laughs> so the book starts out with a story about a woman who is Christian and her husband who is Jewish. Laura points out that neither of them are seriously practicing because if they were, they would have married within their faith. And then I wrote down sidebar, if you truly practice love, grace, and compassion, you would understand you hate the sinner. You hate the sin, not the sinner. I don't know how I came to that. I, had, there was, I side railed. But elaborating on that part right there, if you truly practice love, grace, and compassion, you understand you hate the sin and not the sinner. It is very hard to remove emotions from a situation, especially if you're the one who was on the ass end of being burned. Especially if it's by somebody who is like a repeat offender in your life. They constantly do something. They are known for doing this. They, you get a phone call from them and you're like, your stomach sinks and you're like, oh God, what is it? What is it this time? Please don't let it involve me. Please don't let it affect my life. Removing your emotion and being able to recognize that mental illness is a thing, addiction is a thing, and people can become addicted to a plethora of things, not just substances. You can be frustrated with somebody. You can have, I don't know if animosity is the word, but that's the one. You can have animosity towards them because of their wrongdoings. And it hurts even more when they know that they are wrong, but they just genuinely do not care. That's the worst of the worst. To remove your emotions from that and look at that person objectively and recognize that, maybe place their wrongdoings with a demon on their back, right? That demon has full control over that person. It, it's like a parasitic insect that take over like ants for example or a fungi there's a fungi that takes over insects and literally manipulates its body it keeps its host alive just so it can reap the benefits but this it's a zombie at that point and that's really sad to think about that somebody is so controlled by the demons in their life that they really don't get to experience what what freedom is because freedom is peace Oh, peace is the greatest thing. Sitting outside, listening to the kids laugh, holding my husband's hand in Tennessee, listening to the wind in the tree and there's a fire crackling. That's peace. And you can't have that if there is constant emotional turmoil inside of you. And if, oh, it's a lot. Moving on because I'm going to keep going. On to Laura's point where she said if they were seriously practicing, they would have married within their faith. That's true. If it was really such a big deal, they would have been flexible. You know, they would not have been so flexible on things. Before they got married, the woman promised to raise their children Jewish. But when Christmas rolled around, she put up a tree and wanted to make Easter plans. When her husband told her Jewish people don't do that, she had a conniption fit. 
She wanted the children to experience what she had in her childhood, and now she wanted to find a way to make her husband stop being upset about her broken vow. Let that sink in for a minute, right? The mom has good intentions. She wants to have her children experience the magic of Christmas and Santa and the Easter Bunny and all of the things that come with Christianity. She made a promise to her husband, though. And assuming that he took it seriously because he said something, he's like, hey, we don't do that. You, you promised that we would raise our children as Jewish. Assuming he had a problem with it, why didn't you marry somebody within your face? Faith, right? And this is just pointing out where we're tracing back things, right? We always want to find the root of the problem. They both decided not to marry within their faith. She was flexible. She was like, we can raise them Jewish. If they are being raised in Jewish if in every other aspect, I am not familiar with um, Jewish practices. Judaism, I believe it is called. Oh, wow. I am recognizing I really need to expand myself right now. I'm going to let the wave of disappointment wash over me. Yep. And now I have something I can work on, and that is expanding myself into what other faiths are, what they stand for, and just overall gain some worldly information. All right, let's move on from that moment. <laughs> so if the children are being raised in every other aspect that comes along with the religion of being Jewish, I think that he could yield a little bit to put up a Christmas tree and have Easter baskets and do Santa Claus because neither of you are really, really that serious about it. Just my perspective, tracing back the lines of things. Her breaking her vow. Now, that is a problem. That was a short-term promise. There was not... So many things are popping to my mind. Horizontal view. Um longevity but that doesn't work there there is not any future foresight let's say that there's no future foresight into her promise if she would have really sat down and thought about it i would imagine at some point they would have discussed what their faiths are you know what do you do for christmas if they've been together for years So much is happening. Have they lived together? Have they always celebrated Christmas? Is he putting a nix to Christmas all of a sudden because they have children? There's so much to that. If she would have put some long-term thought into what she wanted her children to experience within their childhood, she would have thought about Christmas. And hopefully they had had conversations about what they expected for the holidays. And if she co-signed or signed off on no Christmas, and then you have regrets, well, that's a conversation. It's not we're doing this and you just have to kind of sit back and allow me to do this and let me change my mind and break a promise I made to you. So things to learn from that little bullet point. Put thought into things. Don't just think short term of, oh, I'm so in love and I'm so happy and life is fantastic right now and it's only been six months, but I know it's going to be like this forever. It's like that way forever if you put work into it. You have to think about five years from now, if we have children, how do we want them raised? What morals do we want them to have? What values do we want them to have? What experiences do we want them to have? If your faith is important to you, do not get married to somebody in the hopes that they're just going to jump on the train of your faith. That's not how that works. You are accepting of that person and accepting of the, the boundaries that they have, maybe. To get married to somebody, to manipulate them, to jump on board with whatever your faith is, is a problem. And the demon on the back, you could say it's a, people say like being an alcoholic, there's a monkey on my back or whatever they say. I do believe that as that is a thing. I think that everybody has at least one demon on their back, at least one. We know it's average of five or six. Let's have a little bit more grace. Let's have a little bit more understanding. That does not mean acceptance of poor behavior in your life. If you have a problem with somebody's actions, they are aware of that and they continue their repetitive behavior that you have a problem with. You have the right to say, look, I am not okay with this. I do not want this quality of life. I do not want to have this kind of turmoil in my life. 
I love you. And that is why I am saying I can't accept this anymore. At what point do we stop just being a bystander and become an enabler? Think about that. Next bullet point. Women don't want to admit they are perfected in wedlock, as are men, when they have um, obligations to family. Perfected in wedlock. What is, what is being wed? What is being married? You are committing yourself to somebody for the rest of your life. I am somebody who is not willing to live in a repetitive cycle of misery. And there are going to be new situations in life, new stressors in life. There is going to be um, outside influences, variables, whatever the situation is. There's going to be something new in your life that is going to alter the way you think for a minute. Right? It's going to trip you up. You're going to get fucked up for a second. Your actions in an episode or in a super stressful period of time or in a bout of depression... There is going to be a recoil from your actions in that. Hopefully, you are somebody who doesn't want to be known as that person who is always depressed, always being vindictive, manipulative, woe is me. I believe that there is pain in all of that. I believe that somebody who is experiencing that, who constantly needs revalidation, revalidation, reassurance, or a validation and they don't feel like they matter without it that that is a very broken emotionally hurt person the way that you go about seeking things though there's a right way and there's a wrong way to do it in marriage you recognize that you are the holder to your happiness the way that you are with your partner is going to be a reflection of you know their behavior is going to be a reflection of how you treat them People match energy, whether they intend to or not. People match energy. So if it's been three years since you guys have had any intimacy, well, when was the last time you tried? And I'm not saying like, hey, if you want to have sex, we can do it. Like, when was the last time you dolled yourself up? When was the last time you put something on that not just made you feel good, but you knew that your man was going to love seeing you in? And if he is somebody who isn't receiving of that or shuts it down or seems uninterested, have you asked him why? Perfected in wedlock. We are the holders of the happiness. Everybody has problematic behaviors. And like I said, it, they can come and go. There could be new ones. There are different things in life that could trigger something. If you don't want to live in a repetitive cycle of misery and turmoil and bullshit and... Maybe escapism in the video games or drinking or going out with friends. Or maybe you're doing the opposite. You're isolating yourself and you're not doing any of your hobbies. You're laying in bed, just watching TV, eating nonstop. You change it. And by being perfected in wedlock, you have somebody, hopefully, you guys have the repertoire. I hope that's the right word to give con constructive criticism and be able to receive that in a way that is becoming of oneself. It's not always going to be pretty. There might be a little trip up. There might be like, damn, you might get a little bit emotional. And after that moment of emotion, still accept that with grace, take the constructive criticism, take it internally and work on yourself. You want to be the best version of yourself for the person that you love. You want to be the person that they feel happy with, that they want to be best friends with, that they want to do everything with. You want to have the intimacy and the love and the, I know you've been gone for three hours, but I miss you. That is that perfected in wedlock, the, the grace, the compassion, the forgiveness, the love, the constructive criticism. On to the next bullet point. Some women enter a marriage thinking about what marriage and their man can do for them. When there is so little emphasis on giving or nurturing, nagging, nitpicking, and frustration soon takes over, chewing up and spitting out what could have been a wonderful marriage. Some women enter a marriage thinking about what marriage and their man can do for them. That's a lot to take in. 
nowadays, a lot of women are focused on he doesn't do this, he doesn't do that, he doesn't make this amount of money. They are, they are looking for the next upgrade. Not saying all women are that way, but there is a vast majority, enough to the point that men are receding from dating and marriage. Not saying that men are super, oh, fuck me, I hate I have to do this. Disclaimer. If you are somebody who is emotionally vulnerable, maybe emotionally wounded, do know that we can have a conversation outside of women's wrongdoings about the things men do wrong and why marriage may not be happening. But that's not the conversation at this point. That can be had later on. A lot of women are looking for the next upgrade, the, the guy who looks better, the one who makes more money. I have, I don't know if it's a term adopted by the masses, but I have a term that I use that's called a serial dater. There are women who are addicted to the high of the lust phase where the first year or two where everything is super dope and everything is great and there's little arguments here and there. But there is the chasing and the wanting and the yearning, the lust. <clears throat> and then over time, that is something that fades because that void is not being filled the same way because it's not new anymore. And then they start to see the flaws of a person that they were willing to overlook in the first year or two because they were getting a void filled. And then they move on to the next person, and then they move on to the next person, they move on to the next person. And I say that from experience because that's something that I did in my teen years. I was super insecure with myself. And once I got bored with a dude, I would move on to the next dude. As an adult, I am recognizing that that behavior is fucked. <laughs> I'm laughing because I am ashamed and disgusted in myself that I did do that at one point. Talk about damaging the self-esteem of somebody. I literally use somebody for my own insecurities and value needing. And once they no longer filled that, I dumped them and moved on to somebody within a week or two because I wasn't worried about long term. I was worried about the short term gratification within myself. And I think a lot of women enter into marriage thinking that way, not just physically or emotionally, but financially. I also agree that there is not a lot of giving and nurturing happening nowadays even in public i see women and of course for the emotionally damaged i also see men degrade their their person in public i can't remember where i was but this old lady was just giving it to her husband in the middle of Publix, and i can't remember what the situation was i just remember going oh my lord like i hope if i like if i ever speak to my husband the way that that woman was speaking to her man I, he deserves better than that there's public shaming happening. There is embarrassment going and talking to his friends behind his back. There's having Snapchats and I'm going to go out and say it. I think that it, like if a dude tells me that his woman does OnlyFans, like by proxy, I'm embarrassed by that. It is what it is. Women can make their bag, the, their bag the, however the way they want to. Just know that there is a perception to all of those things and it wouldn't make me happy I'm good so how do we get back into the giving and the nurturing you start looking at your your husband your boyfriend the person that you're committing yourself to with love and compassion the way you did when you met them if you've been with somebody for 10 years a lot of shit happens in 10 years a lot of disruptions, a lot of disagreements, a lot of I can't believe you did that, I can't believe you said that. Marriage is a commitment to love somebody through all of the mistakes that they make in their life. The bringing up the past and the constantly throwing things in their face and sitting on a couch on a Tuesday night looking at him and going, I can't believe you did this three years ago, I'm still hurt by it. And he has done everything to change that behavior and it not, has not happened since. Stop it. Stop doing that. Give the kind of grace that you would give a child to your spouse. And that's not saying treat him like a child. You love children differently than you love men. Especially if you gave birth to children. It is what it is. You need to have the same grace, the same compassion, the same patience that you have with a two, three-year-old screaming, if you can handle that, 
you can handle the fact that your husband had a hard day, maybe cut himself while working, had a disagreement with his boss, three things got on fire at work that he had to put out, and then he gets home. And you ask him a question, he snapped at you. Have some grace in that moment. Have some patience. If you can deal with a toddler absolutely losing their mind, throwing things, punching, screaming, kicking, you can handle the fact that your husband just slipped up a little bit. Especially if he reeled it back in afterwards and he was like, babe, I'm sorry, I had a really bad day. You let it go. You say, I'm sorry, you had a bad day, babe. What can I do to make it better for you? It's kind of fucked up to think that it is a known thing. Women will 100% say that they will choose their children over anybody, especially the person that they're married to. There is a very obvious love, compassion, and grace given to children that's not given to husbands. And that makes me sad. Next bullet point. It's important to recognize the good in your life to feel happy and fulfilled. You have to be caring, nurturing, and supporting of others. And I want to point out that that starts with yourself. You need to stop holding yourself to a standard that you don't hold others to. As a mom, I feel like I need to get everything done. As a wife, I feel like I need to get everything done in one day. I was thinking the other day, I was putting up the Christmas tree. Well, I didn't put up the Christmas tree. I was decorating the Christmas tree. And I was looking around, and like I walked into my bedroom, and there were our bedroom. I walked into my husband's and I's bedroom, and there's clothes on the floor, and there's dirty laundry, and I haven't made the bed yet, and I have an empty water bottle on my nightstand. And I walk into the living room, and the, re- the living room looks really nice. <laughs> I cleaned up the coffee table. I'm decorating the Christmas tree. I cleaned up the front walkway. The kitchen looks really good. It looks fantastic. Laundry room's kind of a mess. Kids' room's kind of a mess not that bad. I had a moment of either I can lose my mind and panic about how much I need to get done in the house because there's only two areas cleaned, or I can take a step back and recognize that I live my life. Our kids are happy. My husband and I have intimacy. Oh, I'm going to start crying. We have quality time. I would rather spend eight hours with my husband riding dirt bikes Versus being at home, making sure the house is spotless and looks like a home and gardens magazine. I take baths. I play with my children. You look at other moms and you give moms grace. You tell them, yes, life is busy. Your kids are being fed. They are happy. Give yourself that same grace. Once you start having that understanding with yourself that you are not Superman, you're going to be less tense. You're going to feel less stressed. You're going to be less hateful because that hate for yourself oozes out into the world. It does. Once you have that compassion with yourself, you're going to start having it with others and it's going to be a noticeable change. Take a moment, take a step back, look at your life. And really, do you have that much to gripe about? Yes, things happened in your past. Right now, in your present day, where are you sitting? What are you looking at? What's happening? What do you have going on tomorrow? You are not in a life or death situation in this moment. And I would bet 80 80 to 85% of you are are pretty okay in life right now. And a lot of what you have going on is focusing on the past or focusing on the future. 